I ended up choosing the um, Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, but that was only for about a year, right? Yeah, not even, it was a cup of coffee. So Andy Reid didn't talk to me. It was really weird, it left a bad taste in my mouth for a long time. I didn't know what to do, I was distraught. I got married with two kids. Falcons called my agent after, right after the season and said we want to sign him to a one-year deal. But I saw there was helicopters and, and somebody rented an airplane and flew it overhead with a banner on the back of it talking about Mike and the stuff that he did. And the lady in front of him with a couple kids running around getting ready to get her groceries and he'd just buy them for them. Uh, little things like that you don't hear about. Bobby Petrino left a laminated note in all of our lockers. I think for the city of Atlanta, for the whole overall with Mike Smith and Matt Ryan. and Oh my gosh. You know, that, that was, that was a godsend. You know, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, it's pretty cool that you're still here in Atlanta because a lot of people, I guess it's 50-50 on their NFL careers. They kind of stay in the area that they played in for a long time, but then also try to go back home as well. You're from California, right? That's right. And uh, what what made Atlanta your home? So grew up in Southern California. Um, and then when I got to Atlanta and I spent, you know, from 1999, the end of 99 when the Falcons put me on the practice squad, uh, until 2010, yeah, I guess it was February, January of 2011 was my last game against the Packers. And when you spend over a decade in the same city, you kind of build a bit of a brand for yourself. And I was able to do that here. And I had more opportunities to stay here in Atlanta. My kids, uh, two out of four of them were born here. All four were pretty much raised here in Atlanta. And um, between the cost of living uh, weather, the airport, the access to Delta, get anywhere you want, uh, direct. It just made sense. And then the cost of living in Southern California is ridiculous. Oh yeah. And it's, yeah. So Orange County. That's right. LA. Yeah. South of an hour, South of LA. And I mean, traffic here is bad, Yeah, but I've, I've never been out there, so I can't even imagine. What yeah. I mean, here is good, as bad as anywhere. And we never, we rarely made it to LA because traffic and other nonsense that's goes, goes on up there. Orange County has its own traffic problems, but not like LA. So um, between all that stuff, building the brand for myself, having opportunities after football, being kind of an ambassador for the Falcons, um, it made a lot of sense for us to just stay put. The kids were in school. I think when I retired in 2011, uh, so what's that, 15 years ago now? No, 14 years, 13 years ago. Wow. Um, kids were still in the heart of school and high school and middle school and and uh, it just didn't make sense to go anywhere. But, and, and on top of all that, we just, we love the area in Atlanta. It kind of became home for us. No, it's definitely a great area. Now they're building everything and we're like, me and my wife, slow down. You know, there's all, already a lot of people here, but you know, know. you know. It's keep growing, man. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about that career that you had with the Falcons. I mean, I guess it started uh, in high school in California and then trying to commit to college. What, what's the story behind this? Because I kind of read up on uh, Villanova and you had offers from Oregon State, correct? And right. all these other bigger schools. But then your brother was involved in that as well. Yeah, I have decision. an identical twin brother, Brad. Uh, we both wanted to go to school together and play sport together. The Naval Academy offered both of us a basketball deal. Um, but then you had the military come in afterwards. And my dad was in the Army in Vietnam, so that resonated with us pretty good. Um, and then at the end of our recruiting process, um, the Villanova Wildcats came out and it's, we were recruiting the year before they got two kids from Orange County to go out to Villanova, which is just outside of Philadelphia. And they came back and, and recruited Brad and I and offered Brad and I full ride scholarships to go play football. Uh, the Oregon State thing, there was uh, lukewarm looks from Oregon and Oregon State. I had trips planned to go there, but just kind of get pushing back, and they didn't think, I don't think they were very serious, unfortunately or fortunately, to tell you the truth. So we knew we wanted to play together, and we knew we could go to Villanova, get a great education. It's a family environment, Catholic-based school, um, all the things you're looking for, only like 6,000 undergraduates. And um, we knew we could play, in our minds anyway, we thought we could play some one double-A football and um, have some fun graduate with a, with a degree and go find a job when we were done. I mean, I guess it worked out in the end. Uh, it did. I had no real aspirations to play in the NFL. Never. I mean, wow. you can dream about it as a kid. I think I had Dallas Cowboy pajamas and I was a Jerry Rice fan and um, all those different things. But the idea of actually playing in the NFL was, was foreign to us. And then I had a really good freshman year at Villanova, broke some records. My sophomore year, I jacked up my shoulders a couple times and, and missed a few games. 
And then my junior year, we got a new uh, offensive coordinator, and his name was Dave Clausen. And uh, he's gone through the ranks and, and been a lot of different places now, but he's the head coach at Wake Forest and been there a long time. But he changed the whole trajectory of my college career. Uh, brought in a new system, opened it up, had three wide receivers on the field at all times, a couple running backs. And um, for whatever reason, he saw something in me when he, when he took the job and um, put me in the slot position. And I just started to eat and, uh, and do well and had a great year. We had like 81 catches and uh, started getting some small looks from some NFL squads, but it really wasn't until my senior year that it, really, it blew up. Yeah, that 11 personnel definitely worked out for you with that, uh, you playing in the slot. And you kind of don't see that nowadays as far as a 6'5 receiver in the slot. Was that like really foreign back then or did people just kind of nowadays just shift to like more 5'8", 5'9", those faster Wes Wilker kind of people? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know why that happens. I guess because you got to kind of navigate your way through the middle of the defense a little bit, be a little shiftier and, and quicker. But I always thought I, I could play every position. I didn't like be guys being pigeonholed at X or Z or slot receiver. So I, I did get pigeonholed from, from our offense, but I was able to play all of them. And Brad, my twin brother, it was me and Brad, 6'5", six, 6'5", five, six, five, and then Josh Dalvin was the other receiver in our 11 and 20 personnel. And he was 6'2", and could run a little bit. So we were big and strong and, and pretty good athletes, all of us. So we gave defenses fits the way we did it. And... Um, again, I kind of prided myself on being able to do all, every position. Um, I don't even, yeah. It, sometimes you can be more set, like you talked about the Troy Browns of the world and Wes Welkers and, uh, Amon Dolas, those type of guys, um, kind of fit that spot good. But the more you can do and the more positions you can know, they can move you around more. You can motion and shift and, and then you get missed messages that you're looking for. So you talked about the NFL aspirations that you had or you didn't have, did you have aspirations to play in Europe? <laughs> Never mind. Wildest dreams. That was only by necessity. So I had a great senior year at Villanova. Um, I had like 96 catches, 19 touchdowns. I won uh, the Walter Payton Award. Goes to, I was the first receiver in 1AA ever to win it, which is kind of neat. Uh, I was kind of like the Heisman of 1AA. And um, so I got, I went thinking I might, I, we didn't know if I was going to draft it or not. So before I went to Barcelona and played in Europe, I was an undrafted free agent in 98 to the Seattle Seahawks. And I was kind of in over my head. I was tall and thin. I still wasn't able to put on the muscle mass and weight I needed to. So I went in there about 6'5", 200 pounds, and messing with those DBs and linebackers and those other guys, it was it was tough. And I had a lot of... I took a lot of L's, a lot of losses uh, in training camp. A few wins here and there, but my confidence wasn't great. I wasn't the physical specimen I needed to be. So I got cut after training camp and preseason, and nobody picked me up the entire 98 season. So after that season, that's where Europe came into play. And uh, to rewind a little bit, when the Seahawks cut me, we had a coach, his name was Milt Jackson, my receiver coach up there. And he called me after they released me and just said, go play football somewhere. You're good enough to do it. You got to put on a little weight, work on your craft, but I see enough in you to know that you can go play. He's like, I don't care if it's arena ball or Europe, NFL Europe or whatever, go play or even Canada. So I talked to my agent after that season ended and he put my name in the arena draft and um, in the NFL Europe draft. And I was lucky enough to get picked up by the Barcelona Dragons. And um, there's a little backstory there, too, where the head coach of the Barcelona Dragons' name was Jack Bignell, Cowboy Jack, coached at BC for a while, but then spent the last half of his career in Europe. And a great coach, great players coach, loved playing for him. But a quarterback that played there the year prior was named John Kitna. And John was a, one of the backups in Seattle when I, was a, when I was a rookie there in training camp. And John took a liking to me, and we got up got on pretty well so when I left and got cut and he heard I may be going to Europe the next year he called Jack Bicknell and said go get this kid he's, he's a player so they did and I Barcelona drag took me in the first round whatever that is <laughs> whatever draft that is I don't even know when it happened or, or what took place but um, they took me 
and I had an awesome uh, four months in, in Barcelona playing in NFL Europe. That's great. John Kidna. Yeah. And I know that because uh, was it Todd Bauman? Yes. Was a, was a he was my, yeah, he was the, our dragons. He was our quarterback. Dude, there's a whole database out there of just NFL Europe stats. Oh, is that like, right? Archives of like 1998, 1999 seasons, all that. Oh, that's awesome. So that's how I figured that. But John Kidna. Okay. Yeah. yeah so yeah. he put the good word in for me. He had been in Europe, played for the dragons, I think, or at some point got to know Jack McNell and and put the word in for me. And then I was able to put on about 10 pounds of muscle over that year I was off. Um, I kept working out, just doing whatever I could. I had a job. Uh, I was living with my in-laws back in California. I mean, there's this whole roller coaster of different things that had to happen for me to get to Europe. And it, we treated it like a minor league system. Um, some guys enjoyed just being over there in the lifestyle and went over multiple times to play. But my goal was get over there, have a good season and try to get back in the league. And and I was lucky to have Todd Bauman as my quarterback, uh, good players around us, and uh, was like third in the league in receptions and yards and touchdowns. And then when I came back to the States in like June of 99, um, my agent had about 10 or 11 teams that were interested in picking me up. And um, I ended up choosing the um, Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, it was Andy Reid's first year they had just drafted Donovan McNabb in the first round. Doug Peterson was the incumbent quarterback. He's now the head coach in Jacksonville. Um, and they gave me an opportunity to, to get back in the league. That that started out, but that was only for about a year, right? Yeah, not even. It was a cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> it's not. It was five weeks, and then they cut me. Wow. For, and so, it's a, so when I made the team, went through training camp, I uh, had a one-year deal for rookie minimum and one first-year minimum. And uh, they I did pretty good. I got a concussion in the preseason. You know, I just played four straight months in Europe. My body was a little beat up. I had a kind of a quad injury. And these are all excuses I'm throwing out there. And they, I made the team. And when they made all the cuts and I realized I made the team, our special teams coach at the time was John Harbaugh who's the head coach in Baltimore now and has been for what feels like forever. Yeah. And um, when they made those final cuts and I made the team, John Harbaugh came over to me and said, you better be able to play some special teams because we just cut, they just cut another receiver that was a really good special teams player to keep me on the roster because I was a little better receiver, but I wasn't nearly as good at special teams. And um, I was still trying to figure out how to play special teams and uh, it was not great, unfortunately. Uh, but the real kicker was my first real game playing. I think we were at home. Um, we were playing the Arizona Cardinals, and may have been week two. And um, it was late in the game. Doug Peterson is the quarterback. Um, there's about a minute and a half left in the game. We're up by two. Might be like 22 20 or whatever reason. I don't even know how we got to 22, but I'll go back. I'll have to go back and check out the score. But I'm on the left side of the formation all by myself. It's might be third and whatever, third and six or second and six. And Andy Reid was our head coach and offensive coordinator. And he called called my number and gave, had a sluggo, which is a slant and go on the backside. And I killed the corner. And uh, Doug Peterson threw me the ball as I'm running down the sideline. I got about a yard and a half lead on the cornerback. And the ball was just like, if it was here, I think I'm golden, <laughs> like out in front of me all the way. But it was just a little bit like right on my side. When I went to reach to catch it, the ball kind of hit my forearm. And when I tried to corral it, the DB had caught up and he punches the ball in the air. The safety comes over the top and intercepts the ball out of the air. And um, they run it back down to like the 20 yard line and kick the game winning field goal like oh, less than a minute later. So it's Doug's fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not Doug's fault. I should have just spun around and secured the catch. I probably thought about running with it a little bit. So it's one of those lessons you learn the hard way. You know, in a situation like that, late in the game, almost like when you're in the, in the red zone, in the end zone, you just got to secure the catch. doesn't need to look pretty, body it up, two hands, whatever you got to do, you got to secure that catch. And I did not do that. I had a couple rough practices the next couple weeks. Uh, I was inactive the following week and then the fifth week of the season. I was on the golf course with one of the tight ends and a kicker or something, and, and my agent called me and said, uh, 
Falcons are going to let you go today. And uh, he goes, you could go there today, which is a Tuesday, our day off, or tomorrow morning on Wednesday and get all your stuff and clear out your locker or whatever. So I was, I didn't know what to do. I was distraught. I got married with two kids. And once you, if you're not vested in the NFL, um, like you have to be into your fourth season, as soon as you get cut, the money stops coming in and you get nothing. So uh, I went to the facility, got off the golf course, went to the facility, picked up all my crap and and um, and got out of there. No, It was weird because the offensive coaches were in meetings and then they had me meet with the equipment guy. And as soon as I got my stuff done and was looking at him and I was like, am I supposed to talk to anybody else? And he's like, I think they're in meetings or something. I was like, all right, so just get the hell out of here. So Andy Reid didn't talk to me. I didn't talk to my receiver coach. It was really weird. It left a bad taste in my mouth for a long time. Um, but it is what it is. And it's a, it's a show me business and what can you do for me. And apparently I wasn't doing enough. So they cut me. And um, I sat out the next eight weeks. I had a couple workouts. And um, lo and behold, I landed on the Falcons um, practice squad in December of 99. Yeah. So it was cool. But those workouts... I went to New York with the Giants. Um, I went to Jacksonville with the Jaguars. And then I had a workout with um, Atlanta. And when I tell you my workout in Atlanta was like, everything was perfect. The grass was perfect. That's in Swanee at their facility. Yeah, the, the, the old facility. Yeah, the old facility in Swanee. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the Flowery Branch was not a thing. No. Uh, and um, it was an old rundown facility in, in Swanee, but my cleats fit perfect. Steve DeBerg was throwing me balls. There was two other guys I had out there trying out, and I had a great tryout. And a few weeks later, they called me and, and put me on the practice squad. And, uh, you know, it definitely worked out. So what point did you move from the practice squad to the main roster? So I finished the last three games. So I think I joined the team December 13th of 99. I was on the practice squad for the last three weeks of the season. And uh, we, we spent... Aaron and I, my wife and kids spent Y2K inside a extended stay America right off of Pleasant Hill over here and uh, waiting for the world to break down, but it never happened, obviously. Is that the one that you can see off of 85? That's exactly Because I one. drive past that all the time, and we're not sponsored by extended stay, so I say whatever I want. <laughs> okay. I see that, and I'm like, I don't know anyone that would want to stay there. You don't want to. It's by necessity. Uh, we, we didn't have a lot of money, and we just needed a place to stay and rest our heads at night for a few weeks and um that's where we stayed extended stay in america right there so right. it was good and um uh, i finished up that season packed up all our crap got back in the car and headed back to south jersey where we had a little um townhouse condo and kind of didn't know what was going to happen after that um falcons called my agent after right after the season and said we want to sign him to a one-year deal and uh i was like let's do it and um I came back down to Atlanta for for uh, spring training and in camp and OTAs and mini camps and all that and and um, the rest is kind of history. But it was a one year deal, no guarantees to make the roster, no guaranteed money, no nothing. It was just minimum salary and and I was fortunate enough to impress enough guys in the preseason and show that I could play. That's why I don't like when everybody craps all over the preseason because it's it's the reason I stayed in the NFL as long as I did. I had three or four preseasons in a row. Where I, I had like really good numbers, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous, but I was out there playing a lot and playing special teams and tackling dudes and, and making scoring touchdowns and and the special teams and uh, the preseason gave me opportunity to showcase myself to the Falcons, let them know I can play against these guys, and and that's what happened. And then I think I signed a one year deal the following year and a one year deal the next year, and then I got a three year deal. And then I signed a four-year deal, and then a couple more one-year de- one-year deals after that, and 11 years later, here we are. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you hear talk right now. I think current day, Roger Goodell is saying, "Oh, we the less preseason games we can have, the better." And it's now talk of 18 games down to two preseason, preseason. games. But then you want to have those stories like Victor Cruz, who just showed off in preseason, Russell Wilson won the starting job in preseason. You want to have stories like that or players like yeah. that emerge. So. It definitely worked out for you. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And I think two is enough, especially if you go to 18 games. It's too much football to be playing. I, I'm not a huge fan. I, I I think there'll be another bye week implemented implemented in there as well when they do go to 18 games. And it's all about money and, and TV money and everything else. And the NFL is the strongest 
entity as far as sports franchises are concerned right now, and I think will be for a long time. Uh, but the preseason is necessary for coaches to look at the players and see if they have what it takes to play real football and get after it. I do like the fact that you have joint practices now because that ramps it up a little bit too and gives you another opportunity, two or three practices during the week to show that you can play against other guys. Um, but you do have to have a couple because there's going to be those fringe guys that, you're t- that you mentioned that need that opportunity to show that they can play and, and play consistently, and, and that's what the preseason did for me. Then yeah. you got to back it up when you get in the regular season. Yeah, and I mean, definitely worked out in your favor. And this was around this was the 2000 season, right? So they just drafted Michael Vick, mm-hmm. correct? Is that 01? Was that 01? That might have been 01. I think it was. I think it was 01. Yeah. So the first they played season. a full season with Chris Chandler, and then the next season, Chandler and Vick. I think that's where the the, the Vick took over halfway through the season or something. Gotcha. So then you had to. Essentially, I mean, they traded up to draft Vic, so you weren't like the worst team. Oh yeah, in the NFL, but you were you're down there. We were up there, yeah. You were up there. <laughs> we were or up there, I up guess. Up there, or down there. Anyway, yeah. Look at it. Uh, and then Vic comes along, and that ends up being a blessing because a lot of people around Atlanta would say Brian Finneran is his go-to guy, especially in the 2002 season. And that's when it really clicked. What was it about the 02 season that just made you just pop off? I think maturity, uh, growth through my game, and opportunity. Uh, my first couple years in Atlanta, I was a third or fourth guy uh, behind Terrence Mathis and Tony Martin and Sean Jefferson and a couple other guys. So I was still trying to find my way onto the field offensively. And then by 2002, I had done enough in 01 to show them I could play, and then they trusted me. And then Vic and I, for whatever reason, developed a really nice rapport on and off the field to the point where he trusted me a lot on scramble drills or third down situations. And I think between Algie Crumpler and myself, um, Vic knew that there was a better chance than not we were going to make a play for him. So, And then with his running prowess and athleticism uh, and then the running backs that we had, I think we led the league by 04, maybe 3, 4, 5. We led the league rushing two out of three of those years. So uh, being a big receiver, I was able to block well and get after safeties and corners and spring guys loose for big, long runs. And then also, like I said, make plays for Vic. And, and uh, he did. He threw a nice uh, fade route to me and jump balls. And, you know, it wasn't ideal being a receiver in that offense because you weren't getting 120 targets. But you could make some sports center type plays and, and – uh, become a Madden legend if you if you're around Vic <laughs> if you're around Vic long enough, which is in fact what happened, which is crazy. So So, so you're aware of the Madden uh, legend myth. No doubt. No doubt. So um, I ran into a couple of hockey guys, I think it was Brett Hall and a couple of guys in the airport years ago, maybe oh f- five, oh six, and um just went to go say I was a big hockey fan at the time and introduced myself and they said, Brian Finner, oh my gosh, we play Madden with you. And their nickname for me was Glitch. There had to be some kind of glitch in the system for me to be <laughs> that good on the game. But because everybody in America and the world, for that matter, wanted to play with the Atlanta Falcons and Michael Vick, all my numbers kept going up because they would throw the ball to me and use me. And my, I think my height went up. My speed went up. I was 6'7". You know, <laughs> jumping ability was like 99. Speed was 90 when it should have been 80. Uh, catch, catch was like 96. So yeah, it was cool. It was fun to be a part of that. And then couple of youtubers have put some stories out there about it too so it's it's really neat to kind of research and look at and, and I, I what i tell people is i reach my full my full capabilities uh on a video game is where i really <laughs> really hit it yeah it's uh i think the the cover with vic on it oh four uh everybody wanted to play with vic because oh yeah super fast and it was just yeah. you know it was a cheat code but then yeah with you oh, gosh they have this thing called madden ultimate team mm-hmm. um i don't really play it but um you pretty much get like training cards of players yes. and stuff like that. So that's, yeah. I think it was like Madden 16, like well after you retired. Yeah. And I said, like, oh, Brian Finneran. And it's just like a glitch or something. Yeah. But, they did a all legend team 25th anniversary or something. And uh, the wide receivers were Randy Moss and, and myself. And Jerry Rice was like our backup. It's hilarious. <laughs> so dumb. It's so, <laughs> it is. Over the top. If you look it up and, and research it, there's some funny stuff out there. Away from Madden, real life football. Yeah. Um, so that 0-2 season happens. You become this reliable receiver. Uh, and then I guess 
tragedy struck for like those two years in 06 and 07 mm -hmm. when injury was was kind of oh, yeah. a kind of a plague uh what d describe to everybody what it's like to deal with a, a long-term injury with the nfl because for an nfl player i think a lot of people assume like oh he's good he's just sitting at home doing whatever but it's it a lot more to that oh yeah big time big time I was fortunate to have a good relationship with Jim Mora Jr., who was a head coach at the time. He was there for two years, 04 and 05. We had some good teams at NFC title run in 04. 05, uh, we had a great start and then cooled off in the end. So going into the 2006 season, it's training camp. It's like July 29th or something. And two days into training camp, I just signed a four-year deal. My first time really, second maybe second time in my career, I felt really secure in my position. Like, I'm not going to get cut. I'm going to be here for a couple years. Uh, financially, I uh, was fairly well taken care of. So everything was looking great. My body, I felt I was stronger than I had been my whole career. And two days in the training camp, I'm out there and I'm running routes. And there was a Virginia Tech. It was not his fault, but he was covering me. He rookie from VTech. I can't remember why I keep forgetting his name, but it doesn't matter. Um, I ran a deep dig. And when I planted, I turned in, my foot stayed in the ground and everything else kind of came inside. I dislocated my kneecap and tore my ACL, MCL, PFL, meniscus, ripped the VMO muscle off the bone. I mean, it was wow. It was bad. It was traumatic. I was yelling and screaming. Because it felt, the sensation was that my knee, my lower leg was dislocated because my kneecap was out here on the outside of my knee. Uh, but once the trainer got it back in place, I finally calmed down got into the training room and my wife was in California at the time because she got she went out there before the kids started school with them and I was there with them and I flew I flew back early for camp so she was still there for another week or so with the kiddos and coach Moore was like came into the training room I'm sitting on the training table and you know you feel like your career is over I was 30 years old had a decent wow. career that up to that point and um he's like you got to call Aaron and tell her what happened I was like, I'm going to be a freaking mess if I try to call my wife right now, just emotionally. So I tried to call her. And I was boohooing like a baby and trying to talk to her. So Coach Morrow took the phone and just told her what happened. Then I'm probably going to need surgery and, and everything else. So you have the surgery and take care of everything. And then, like you talked about, the grind back is real. And it's monotonous and hard and painful. And talk about blood, sweat, and tears for that process. If you, if you don't have the right mindset, the right people around you, a great training staff and good doctors, it can be miserable. And it is miserable anyway for a little while. So I rehabbed for 10 months. I was running full speed routes. Um, we fired Coach Mora during that time, brought in Bobby Petrino, the total D bag, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, you can edit That's a good that way to put it. Too. And um, I, it was mini camp. And DJ Shockley and I go out before before practice starts, and he's throwing me past to get through about 15 routes, do the route tree, catch the last one, turn up field. And when I turned up field, my knee just kind of went sideways. And I had a cadaver ligament as my new ACL, which I would not recommend to any athletes out there. If you're like a grandma or not going to be athletic, go ahead and go for it, but not for athletes. My body rejected it 10 months into rehab. Uh, the trainer came over and looked at my knee and did the old ACL test. And he, I looked on his face and then I was like, no freaking way, dude. Same, same knee. Same knee. Same. It didn't hurt because it wasn't my ligament, you know? Um, so I went to Dr. Andrews in Birmingham, went through the whole process again through the entire 2007 season. So I missed two full years and um, came back. Um, and that, at this point, we had hired a new coach, Mike Smith. He brought in Mike Malarkey as the offensive coordinator and Terry Abisky, one of my favorite coaches of all time, as a receiver coach. And for whatever reason, they gave me a shot. I think Terry liked veteran players. Thomas Dimitrov was a general manager. I don't know how much he liked me or wanted me around, but the coaching staff said enough and did enough, and I showed enough during that training camp after missing two straight seasons that I could still play. I played with a brace on, and my receiver coach said, whatever you do, you have to show up to every practice because these guys don't think you're going to make it through training camp. So as long as you get out there and dress out and show up, I'll take care of you during practices. 
like I'll put you on the backside of a run play where you just sprint across the field and and I'll do this and you run a hitch instead of a post route or whatever. So he took care of me during camp and I could still play special teams, which was huge. So now I'm taking up two spots as far as a special teams player and a third or fourth receiver. So that helped me as well. And um, Matt Ryan was our new rookie quarterback and I played the next three years uh, with Matt and it was awesome. I probably had no business playing three more years with coming off two ACLs, but I worked hard, good support group around me, like my wife and, and everybody, and, and, and Mike Smith and Terry Bisky and Mike Malarkey. I owe a lot to them for my last three years, for sure. I wasn't yep. that productive. I mean, you go look at the numbers. I think one year I had 20 catches, another year I had 15, and yeah. a couple of touchdowns here and there. But And it was just, you, I guess, attributed to the injury or age? Yeah, age, of injury, uh, better players. Every freaking year, it felt like they um, drafted a new guy. Roddy White came in in 05. 05. Yeah. Michael Jenkins before that. Harry Douglas in 08. Um, they traded for, in free agency, they got Marte Jenkins. Peerless Price is one of those guys. So, you know. Um, but I was getting older. And um, I think my leadership ability, special teams play, and maybe contribute a little bit on, on at the receiver position kept me around for a few, few extra years, which was which was nice. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a blessing to, uh, I, I think for the city of Atlanta, for the whole re- overall with Mike Smith and Matt Ryan. and Oh my gosh. You know, that, that was, that was a godsend. Yeah. Have those guys to pick Smitty, go back-to-back winning seasons for the first time in, in franchise history, and then rattle off, I think, four or five um, to go to the postseason a few times, and then Matt was Matt was special too. So it was a good yeah. time to be a Falcon fan for sure. During that time, though, with uh, the transition, I mean, I know that Michael Vick and that whole thing happened. How did you? Uh, I, I guess I don't know if you remember hearing about that. Where were you, and how did the whole locker room react? So to it's that? it's interesting. Um, so I was I was close with Mike. His locker was right next to mine for six years. He was a funny guy, great sense of humor. He was always personable and, and good to me. There's stories about him where he'd be at the local Coke Kroger or Publix and a lady in front of him with a couple of kids running around getting ready to get her groceries, and he'd just buy them for them. Uh, little things like that you don't hear about. You will hear about the dog fighting and, and that kind of stuff, but he's the ultimate redemption story, I think, with the stuff that he did and the things he's doing today. So good for him for coming out of that on, on the right side and, and understanding how important it was for him to, to do the things that he did. Uh, but it was tough. It was brutal. Uh, I didn't feel it as much as the other players because, like we just talked about, this was in minicamp in 07 is when I tore my knee up. And then going into training camp in 07 was when this stuff happened with Vic and everything came out. So I was off rehabbing and, and not – as much of the team as I wanted to be because Petrino again was a piece of work. So, um, but I saw there was helicopters and, and somebody rented an airplane and flew it overhead with a banner on the back of it, talking about Mike and the stuff that he did and the madhouse of media attention that was there at Flyer Branch. The first day of training camp was insane. Um, we had players in the preseason. I think Roddy White pulled up a shirt after a touchdown. Maybe it was a regular season game. I don't know. It said free Mike Vick. So, mm. There's a lot going on. Um, it was tough. Uh, first time I heard about it was probably the first time you heard about it in the news. And it was devastating. You hate to hear that a friend and, um, and, and fellow employee and, and, and friend, a good friend, could do the stuff that he was accused of doing. So unfortunate, terrible decisions, obviously, but we all make mistakes. And, and it's how, I think it's how you bounce back through that adversity. And, and Mike, is, Mike is a big-time an awesome story if you can kind of it's hard to do not remove it but take it all into account and then realize how far he's come since that yeah that you know there's going to be a lot of people that for the rest of their lives are going to be oh yeah dogging on michael vick mm-hmm. uh, poor choice of words but um <laughs> nice work uh but there's a lot to it like you said how he accepted responsibility for it put in his time and just come out on the better end of that. Uh, so I think there's a lot to, to learn from that. Uh, yeah, that the whole 07 season, though, it was, you know, Joey Harrington coming in and then Byron Leftwich and all these, like, full first rounds. And, uh, yeah, like you said, Bobby Petrino, 
also on top of that, just yeah. did not help at all. It was, um, it was a really weird locker room too. Martin Anderson, we brought back around that time. Right. And he was like, he's never seen a locker room with so many people walking on eggshells. He'd been in 25 years in the NFL. Yeah. He'd never seen anything like it. Warwick Dunn, who has, doesn't have a bad thing to say about anybody, not a fan of Bobby Petrino. So the whole thing, it was a disaster. And like you said, the fact that Arthur Blank hired, they hire Dimitrov and Mike Smith and, and get Matt Ryan. I mean, that was, you talk about changing everything, going from like the worst looking, ugliest franchise in the league at that time with all the stuff that's happened and the way we were playing to a playoff run with Matt in his first year and then 15 years of success with him later. Yeah, definitely a huge turnaround. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the internal reaction to Petrino leaving a note and saying he's moving so on? So Bobby Petrino left a laminated note in all of our lockers telling us that he, I don't even know what the hell it said. A couple of guys posted it on social media at the time, but I wasn't even on it then. But just a note, let us know that he's moving on and, and going to Arkansas to be the head coach there or something. And I mean, it was Bush League. It was uh, cowardly. Um, he pretty much lied to Arthur Blank's face, I think, the week prior when Arthur asked him if he was sticking around or not because the rumors were out there. Uh, so overall, it was it was a sense of relief that we'd have to deal with that guy anymore. Uh, but it was brutal as an organization to have to kind of be a, a bit of a laughing stock in the NFL. Like, what is the... I guess the traditional NFL way of a coach announcing, hey, I've been let go or I'm moving on or. It depends on the time and place. Um, sometimes you don't get an opportunity because it happens a week or two after the season. Guys are gone. Guys have packed up and cleaned up. Their lockers that aren't there. You may never hear from them. Um, other times they have an opportunity to, to address the team, which uh, Dan Reeves did because he got word that Arthur Blank was going to fire him. Uh, and Arthur Blank, he approached Arthur Blank. I believe this is how the story goes. Dan Reeves got word that he was going to be fired, and there was about three weeks left in the season, I think. And um, he asked Arthur Blank if that was the case, and Arthur said yes, and Arthur wanted him to finish out the season, but then Dan, had, <laughs> I guess, did not want to do that. So he walked away, and mm -hmm. uh, it was unfortunate. I love Dan. He was a great coach, um, kept me in the league for a few years early in my career. I needed a coach like that, disciplined old school. Um, so it was cool. It was like Chris Chandler was old at the time, football old, like 36 or 35. And I was 24 and, and, um, trying to find my way. And when I heard Chris Chandler call coach Reeves, Dan, that was the first time in my life. I was like, holy cow, these are like grown men talking to each other about stuff. But I was still, I was still coach Reeves all the way through. Just there's a level of respect there. But as I grew and became closer with the coaches, like Coach Mora, he called Jim every once in a while, and Smitty, Mike Smitty, called Smitty. Um, so you, as you get more mature and, and start treating them more as equals as opposed to, you know, up here, it's kind of fun in the NFL to figure that out. But Dan Reeves, Coach Reeves is always Coach Reeves to me. So it was Reeves, Mora, Petrino, and then Mike Smith for me over my tenure. Yeah, and then I guess to uh, go to, towards the tail end of your career, the 2010 season I think was very magical uh, what made you decide after that season, I'm going to hang it up? Was it just, hey, I can't do this anymore as far as the injury goes? I'm just getting old. What is it? It's the organization telling you that you're done. And that's fine. Listen, so I got a call again from my agent, and um, I knew what it was about. It was probably February of 2011, and we had just been the number one seed. We made it to the um, – we were in the – it was wild card, and then we had we hosted Green Bay Packers, and Aaron Rodgers went crazy. He was like 34 of 38, and so that was my last game. I had a pretty good game too because Tony Gonzalez went out with an ankle injury, so they put me in his spot, so I was able to play. So Matt must have thought Tony was still in the game because he was feeding me at that point. I had a couple nice catches. So after that seed, game's over, we lose, season's over. A few weeks later, they call me in, and I go into Mike Smith's office, and it's Dimitrov and Mike Smith. And I said, what's up? I pretty pretty much knew what was coming. Um, and they kind of got right. They didn't beat around the bush. And Smith's like, listen, you've been awesome. We've loved having you here. You've been a big part of what we've done the last few years. Uh, here's an organization and, and a team, and uh, we're going to move on. We're going to go try to get a little bit younger and, and faster. And, 
and um, we appreciate everything you did. And we chatted for a few minutes, and I told him uh, I appreciated everything he did for me. And I told him I think I I think I can play another year, but we all think we can play another year, right? Um, so I was disappointed, but I understood what was happening. And lo and behold, uh, they did upgrade slightly and moved up from like 20. 20 just slightly. Just yeah. slightly. <laughs> where they drafted Julio Jones and XC that, that draft a couple few months later. So that was the right decision for them. And uh, I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't have any ill will or bad feelings for them. It was time to move on. I thought I could play one more year. I worked out that whole season, played some basketball at Lifetime Fitness, worked out, uh, was in good shape. I had one workout that season in November, and it was in San Francisco with the 49ers. Jim Harbaugh was the coach at the time. I guess Kaepernick was the quarterback. Yeah, it was Alex, Alex Smith, Smith maybe. First. Yeah, maybe yeah. it was Alex, but they're both there, I think. And um, I had a good workout where the doctor's like looking at my knee, and he's like, it's pretty grindy in there. This is after the two surgeries and everything else. And I was like, yeah, I know. Um, I tried to Jedi mind trick him and tell him I'm just trying to play one more. Actually, it's just the end of that season. I just need like five more weeks. They made a nice little postseason run. Um, but I didn't get picked up. And then I retired, quietly retired after that season. If I had one regret, I didn't know I should have done this. And maybe I shouldn't have. But I watched like Roddy White retire and Todd McClure retire and have like a little ceremony. And I was like, dang it. I wish I would have done something like that just to say thanks to the fans and uh, the team and all the different coaches I had. But I didn't have that opportunity for whatever reason. I didn't force the issue. So if there's one thing I wish I could have done, that's probably it. But it really doesn't matter. So I I guess my agent put in my retirement papers, if that's even a thing. And then that was it. I was done. And do you uh, still have any sort of connections with the Falcons organization? Oh, 100%. Uh, that's what I talked about at the beginning of this interview. Staying in Atlanta was a big part of that was my relationship with the Atlanta Falcons and Arthur Blank and, and different coaches and players that have come through here and staff for that matter. I got to know everybody. You know, spent 11 years in the same job. You know everybody. And I was able to build a brand for myself. So I consider myself an ambassador for the Falcons. Um, they have like a group of go-to guys, I think, to use for community relations stuff and charitable things that they're involved with, whether it's Children's Hospital of Atlanta, uh, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, any events that they have uh, down at the Dome with Mercedes-Benz or uh, Home Depot. I mean... The amount of stuff I've done with the Falcons over the last 13 years has been awesome. I think a nice little, some some are paid gigs, some are um, some are just uh, charitable stuff or community relations things. So, 1,000% have a great relationship with the Falcons. I hope to always have that relationship with them. We're doing the uh, first ever Falcon fan cruise coming up in May of next year, where it's like me, Dave Archer, Ovu Mahaley, Michael Turner, Michael Haynes. Uh, DJ Shockley are all going on this fa fan cruise where they could ha mingle with the Falcons and we sign autographs and have dinners with people and, and do that. So it's really fun. You get to do some fun things. I got to go to Arthur Blank's ranch up in Montana. I was most recently asked to go as an ambassador to uh, London to see them play the Jaguars. And when I tell you, when they invite you to that thing, they do it right. You can bring your wife as long as you, or a friend as long as you pay for their ticket to get out there. They fly you out first class, put you up in hotels, feed you. They put you to work though. When I was in London, we did a bunch of stuff uh, with the Falcons cheerleaders and community relations staff. So the long and short of it is yes. We do a ton of stuff with the Falcons and I'm, I'm grateful that they've allowed me to kind of keep my name around and, and be a part of it. That's great. Now that's still have a connection with the team oh, yeah. that you you know, and still live here locally. That's, that's, that's amazing. Uh, the current day Falcons though, I just want your thoughts on yeah. that. Uh, I think a lot of controversy right now is, you know, Michael Penix, I think, uh, still to this day, even after hearing <laughs> explanation after explanation on why they did it. I think a lot of people are just like, I, I get it, but. Uh, right. You got to wait two years, two plus years to see if it's the right, essentially. right move. Right. Yeah. So I don't know if, um, I don't know. Did you say controversy? I, it's interesting. I was not a fan of the position pick at eight this year's draft with Michael Penix, but the player himself, I think he's a, I think he's a legit quarterback. I just think you could have helped Kirk Cousins win today by drafting the best defensive player on the board. 
And by the way, no defensive players were taken off the board at that time. I'm like, this is perfect. Whoever you like the best defensively, defensive tackle, defensive end, outside linebacker, defensive back, cornerback, whatever, whoever you like, they are there staring you in the face at number eight. You can move back to nine because Chicago wanted to come up and take a Dunze, but you didn't do that. So they did it. And I'm going to, I'm going to cheer for him still. Uh, I felt bad for Kirk Cousins more than anything, but I love, I love Kirk Cousins. I love the fact that you brought a guy like Zach Robinson in here to run the offense in West Coast style, coming from the Rams, from Sean McVay. Um, I love that Kirk has uh, familiarity with this offense and the studs he has outside, and Bijan Robinson and Drake London. He's going to have a great year. Kyle Pitts is healthy, finally. He's going to have another huge year. Um, the question marks for me are on the defensive side of the football. And that's can anybody kill the quarterback? Do we have a stud? Does this um, is it um, Braden? Oh, that that just drafted. Yes, is it Braden Allen? No, that's that's, that's no. a guy in New York. Okay. Uh, It'll be Trice. Um, Braylon Trice. <laughs> yeah, Braylon Trice. <laughs> Braylon Trice. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a song that reminds me of him all the time. Um, maybe he's the answer. You got uh, a row, row, row. You picked up as well, big defensive tackle. You got um, Doorless. I think out of Oregon. So you drafted three straight defensive line guys after you took Penix number one uh, with your first over, with your first pick at number eight. So I'll, I, I, I'm always cautiously optimistic. And I love this team. I, this, I realized what becoming a fan was when I stopped playing for the Falcons. We always played so many sports. I was never like a real fanatic of anything. But once I stopped playing for the Falcons and became a fan of, of the team, I lived and died by their wins and losses. And it, I realized what fans went through as I was out there playing. He started thinking about people, time and money and effort and energy and all that stuff and heart and soul they put into their teams. I was feeling it, and I really got a taste of it in our Super Bowl run in 2016. Uh, and I was on the bad end of that one. But mm. that's when I really felt what it meant to be a fan, I think, deep down inside. That was a killer. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's been good. Yeah. It sounds like you know a lot about your stuff. It's almost as if uh, you keep up with it and you analyze it. So it's, yeah. is that what you do nowadays, too? Yes, it is. I'm on 680 The Fan, uh, 680TheFan.com if you want to check it out. It's a sports talk radio show here locally in Atlanta. Um, we've got an app. You can tap that app and check us out every day. There's a video on there, or you can just listen to the radio station. And we do Monday through Friday, 6 to 10 in the morning. There's four of us on there, myself and home team. Uh, John Michaels and Joe Hamilton, and uh, we just kind of yuck it up. It's called the locker room for a reason because it gets you back in that locker room environment, kind of go back and forth like we did here today and and have fun talking sports and, and uh, busting balls and, and doing the stuff that you do in a locker room. Love it. Well, Brian, I appreciate you taking the time. Best of luck to you and, and everything that you do, and, uh, yeah, we'll just see how the Falcons uh... – They're going to be well, good gonna... this year. I can feel it. Well, we'll make the playoffs for sure, and then if we lose – because we missed a sack or whatever. I'm You're keeping tabs? I'm keeping tabs. All right, we'll see what happens. We'll see. Brian, thanks for your time. Thank you. Appreciate you.